And welcome back. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. Good morning, Neeraj. It was a three-day week, but we ended on a positive note. This week, uh, you know, we're going to start off by seeing reactions to Reliance numbers, HDFC Bank's numbers. But nonetheless, an exciting week lined up. Yeah, in Sydney, we liked up lots of earnings and lots of insurance companies and banks, as well as auto companies coming out numbers, plus the US GDP numbers on Friday. So lots to watch out for. Interesting to see what Maruti does, considering how the stock has performed uh, in the month of April itself and how it's actually moved up from those lows. But SGX Nifty right now uh, showing a slightly more tempered start, about a quarter of a percent under for the SGX Nifty. That's 11,774. Uh, while the rest of Asia is trading more mixed bag. Hang Seng is closed for trade, so you're not getting any cues from there. I'm going to watch out for a lot more uh, come start of trade here as well. But one stock they're going to watch out for is ICICI Lombard General Insurance, which has posted strong earnings for the month for the quarter of Mar March ended. Gross direct premium went up by 19% against the same period last year. Sharad Dubey had a chat with the MD and the CEO, uh, Bhargav Das Gupta, and started off by asking about the segments that contributed to the growth. Listen in. The segments that have grown well for us have been the segments that we have been focusing on uh, uh, in terms of the retail businesses, the SME businesses, and some of the uh, corporate lines of business. Uh, so motor has done well for us, uh, health has done well, property lines have done well. Uh, so these are the segments that we've been focusing on in terms of channels, we've been focusing on our agency channel, uh, we've kind of built out a very uh, deep distribution model into the smaller towns, that segment has done well. So it's been a reasonably across the board uh, growth in the segments of business that we've been uh, focusing on. Okay, in FY20, as we all can expect, this momentum to continue and from which segments do we expect the momentum to stay? So the uh, endeavor that we have and the effort that we're making is to ensure that the momentum uh, stays and uh, that's largely driven by the investments that we've made in uh, some of these distribution channels that we've talked about. Uh, going ahead, we believe, uh, you know, health insurance as a segment will uh, probably go faster, grow faster than the other segments. Uh, as regards motor, we are seeing some slowdown in new vehicle sales and I think that will have some impact in the faster of half of the year. But uh, at least for us, we've been able to increase our market share in that segment and that should help us in terms of maintaining the growth momentum in that area. The other segment that we are focusing a lot on is the SME uh, channel and that's growing well for us and we believe that will continue to grow well. And uh, overall, uh, the corporate segment, we are seeing a large number of wins and these are large and medium corporates. Uh, we are seeing business shifting to some of, uh, you know, to us and that's, uh, that's a segment that we believe will continue to do well. Your combined ratio has improved this time. Tell us about the loss ratio and the expense ratio and what are the targets going into FY20? So our combined ratio has improved to about 98% for the quarter. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the improvement, it's uh, driven largely by loss ratio improvement and expense ratio has been largely contained. Uh, in terms of uh, way ahead, uh, there are multiple factors that we have to analyze. Uh, the first is that as of now, the regulator, uh, the authority, uh, IRD has not given a third party price increase. That has an adverse impact in terms of our, uh, you know, profitability going ahead. So if that is not corrected soon, that may have some impact going ahead. But hopefully we will be able to uh, manage our book in a manner so, as that, so that we can maintain our target combined ratio at around 100 or below. So could you talk about your investment book? Where does it stand at currently and what kind of growth or degrowth it has seen this year? Also right now the market is at new highs, but last year, last one year has been quite volatile. So what changes you have done to your investment book? So look, our investment philosophy is first safety, then liquidity and third returns. Because as it is in insurance, there is a fair amount of risk that we take on our books. We don't want to create additional risk out of our investment portfolio. Having said that, the approach that we've taken is uh, to allocate most of our investment to, uh, bo the, to the bond market, uh, largely uh, very high rated corporate bonds and government securities and, uh, and, a, and a relatively smaller portion in the equity segment. Now, our performance on the equity segment has over the years been very, very uh, positive. If you look at our experience over now 15 years that we've been investing in equity, 
we've had a, a return, a CAGR return of what 27% on our equity book, much better than what uh, Nifty has been able to deliver. Uh, in terms of the bond side, as I said, it's largely very high quality uh, exposure in, uh, uh, you know, uh, exposure in very high quality corporates and uh, government uh, bonds, and that's performed really well for us. So the industry was hoping for a five to ten percent hike in the third party motor prices, which has not happened. Considering the inflation, what impact will have on your financials going for this year? As I said, that's uh, you know an issue that we are worried about uh, because uh, the inflation that we see in uh, claims on the third party side, and these are largely driven by underlying wage inflation as also court orders, where which are getting more and more liberal. Uh, we see a double digit inflation in uh, in third party claims. Uh, now, if you don't see a price increase of at least five to ten percent, you are by design increasing the loss ratio of uh, of that segment. So we are hopeful that uh, the regulator will soon consider it and uh, you know pass on the increase that we need. What's your outlook for your own damage pricing? Any scope for changes there? So on the own damage side, uh, as of now, the pricing is uh, got very very tight because of competitive dynamics in the industry. Uh, we believe that these pricing levels cannot sustain. So we are hopeful that prices will increase. This is usually what happens in insurance. Uh, for a period when prices become, you know, get very competitive, we see some price imp improvements and that's something that we are looking forward to. All right, the other one that we're going to watch out for closely is HDFC Bank that reported a strong growth in quarter four with a 23% jump in profits. Stable asset uh, as well uh, helped in lower and lower provisions for bad loans aided the numbers. Let's get in an analyst view on the same. Mona Ketan of Reliance Securities is joining us on the phone line right now. Mona, um, good morning to you. A good, strong set of numbers, but what was the standout for you from HDFC Bank's quarter four performance? Hi, good morning. So I think uh, one of the important takeaways or the interesting takeaways this quarter was uh, uh, the the increase in margin on a sequential basis, uh, despite the fact that uh, cost increased during the quarter, the cost of funds as well as uh, the growth in deposits were higher related to advances. And uh, despite all these, the margins increased because of uh, change in loan book, uh, the change in loan book mix. And uh, that's largely uh, was in, uh, that was the most important takeaway for us. And uh, uh, yeah. What about the fact that this time around there was a strong 8% deposit accretion on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. That is that encouraging enough? And what would happen to the stock now? Yeah, that was interesting. I mean, how uh, the deposit accretion happened, and uh, particularly because a large part of it is coming from granular side. Uh, so uh, that's helpful. Uh, and uh, uh, despite the fact that CASA on a year-on-year -year basis has declined, uh, we believe that... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, a large part of it has happened because of rising, uh, 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 you know, TD rates, term deposit rates, and uh, uh, a shift in, uh, you know, uh, uh, customers from savings to term deposit accounts. Uh, so as far as our uh, call on the bank is concerned, I think uh, uh, it's got a very strong lending and deposit franchise, and uh, with a uh, healthy capital position and uh, uh, in impeccable performance on the asset quality side. Uh, we'll, we believe that ROAs will uh, remain stable over the years or quarters and uh, we maintain a positive, positive stance on the bank. Okay, <clears throat> got that Mona. Quick uh, comments from Mona there on HDFC Bank's quarter for performance. Thank you so much Mona Ketan. Bringing in uh, Aminash Gorakshekar, Head of Research at Joindre Capital Services joining us right now as well. Aminash, good morning to you. Uh, at 2200 plus for HFC Bank post the quarter four numbers, what does one do? No, I think Devina clearly, uh, if you see the numbers, very strong uh, numbers both on the loan book side as well as on the pre-operating profit side. Uh, and I think the markets were more than happy. These numbers were much better than what the street expected. And I think clearly uh, they plan to raise another round of uh, you know bond funding. Uh, so obviously that is going to aid the capital funding base. 
uh, our sense is that uh, you know this uh, bank has always delivered much better than the street expected and i think uh, even at these levels if one were to take a you know one and a half or two year call i think despite the fact that valuations are not cheap i think the kind of growth momentum and the kind of asset quality this bank has been maintaining i think uh, definitely it's a good portfolio pick and i think clearly looking at the way the new year is going to start uh, fy20 should be a lot better than fy19 Okay. So buy an HDFC bank or buy some of the other banks which could give a bigger, bigger bank for the buck? No, I think uh, HDFC bank definitely comes at a slightly higher premium. But I think looking at the kind of growth, uh, you know, positioning plus the asset quality base, I think HDFC bank definitely, uh, you know, deserves a place in the portfolio. But I think there are other bigger banks like uh, ICICI Bank, Axis Bank, even a smaller bank like DCB, I think, uh, reported pretty good numbers, uh, you know, in the last week. So I think clearly you're going to see a lot of traction on the private banking side. Uh, I would be a little cautious on the PSU banks, Neeraj. Okay, how do you expect Reliance to do today? If it starts off lower because a lot of downgrades that have come in, would you use that as an opportunity or there is still some time to do that? No, I think Neeraj, uh, beyond uh, I think the numbers which were more or less in line, I think the uh, bigger positive was the geo number. I think uh, the markets were quite happy to know that uh, you know they have generated a EBITDA margin of almost 39 percent there. Uh, the crude piece is definitely going to face challenging headwinds. I think with crude now touching almost 73, 74 dollars a barrel, uh, maintaining the GRMs going forward is going to be a challenge. So I would believe that yes, you could see a little bit of selling and uh, at least in the near term you could see that maybe the absolute profit may not grow uh, in tandem with the entire top line growth. In fact, the fourth quarter top line growth was uh, you know down and uh, it was only the geo business which actually generated a positive kind of momentum. So I would believe that yes, maybe in the near term the stock could underperform. All right, uh, that's Reliance Industries, and we'll try and get in some uh, technical calls as well once our technical experts join in. But Avinash Tehamath has lots more to talk about. In fact, let's go across to our research team. They're joining in right now to highlight for us what are the other stocks in news that could have an impact on the stock price this morning and some other key earnings that came out post-market hours. And Nikki, Mishika, both here with us. Mishika, let's start off with you first on stocks news. Yeah, so the first stock we're looking at is Dr. Reddy's Laboratories. US FDA has classified inspection for the Andhra Pradesh Formulations Plant uh, as voluntary action initiated. On January 15th, US FDA had issued Form 483 with four observations for this plant in its audit. When Brickwork Ratings and Care Ratings downgrade Reliance Capital's rating to A and A plus, A plus and A for long-term debt program, marketing debentures and subordinated debt, the downgrade was made due to change in parent company. And Brickwork Ratings and Care Ratings have downgraded Reliance Home Finance's rating as well to A plus and triple B plus on long-term debt program, market-linked debentures, subordinated debt and non-convertible debentures. GVK Power and Infra's arm signs agreement with Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and National Investment and Infrastructure Fund for an investment in new shares in the group's airport holding company equating to a 49% stake. The proceeds from the proposed transaction will be used by GVK towards uh, retiring debt obligations of up to 5,750 crore rupees. Then we have Asian Granito. They've entered the sanitary uh, where segment with 160 SKUs in products including wash basins, water closets and urinals. Uh, the company will invest 8 crore rupees for expansion in this segment and they expect that this business to do a turnover of 50 to 100 crores in the next 3 to 4 years and the commercial launch is expected to be done by June across India. Right, Shika, thanks a lot for that. Some numbers, Nikki? Post yeah, I'm addressing two numbers. First one is Tara Coffee, a reported good set of numbers. Actually, if you look at the top line, that's a flat growth coming in. Uh, almost a 5% uptake from revenues from Operation EBITDA. The operational performance of the company has been healthy. 69% uptake there, YOY basis. Clearly, the cost-saving metrics have been aiding the operational performance of the company. On account of that, you're also seeing margins expanding to 14% as compared to 8.4% in the corresponding quarter. And the profitability automatically goes up uh, as much as 63 percent at 10.5 crore and uh, the other the cost saving and improved performance in the plantation and instant coffee business has uh, percolated down well in the financials of Tata Coffee leading to a strong show coming in from the company. Jay Bharat Maruti typically not a good set of numbers top line flat at 480 crore net profitability has taken uh, a down take it's a down take there 39 percent down YOY based at 11 crore as compared to 
a figure of around 18 crore. That's essentially because of uh, the higher finance cost combined with the dismal uh, operating performance there. EBITDA, which is down by 7.5% at 44 crore as compared to 48 crore. And the margins of the company effectively have also shrunk a little to 9% as compared to 10% in the corresponding quarter. However, the company has declared dividend of around uh, 2.5 rupees per share. All right. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Vishika. Appreciate it. So those are some stocks you can watch out for. Uh, this week is going to be important again because you're going to have big auto numbers coming out. And Avinash, for the auto sector, it's going to be important, particularly from Maruti's standpoint, considering the beating that it's got and the comeback that it has seen in the last one month. Yeah, I think uh, if you ask me, Maruti has uh, publicly stated that uh, they are uh, confident of reducing the inventory in the system over the next uh, couple of months. And I think clearly the markets would obviously not be looking at the absolute number for Q4, which uh, quite frankly would definitely be, uh, you know, disappointing and, uh, you know, downwards. But overall, I would believe that FY20, hopefully once the inventory in the pipeline reduces and uh, they're able to actually generate uh, 8 to 10 percent kind of volume growth, we could see definitely some more uh, price action and better earnings kind of uh, you know improvement on the Maruti uh, front. I would believe that maybe the June quarter uh, may be a little softer, but for beyond June, hopefully uh, with a good monsoon, I think rural demand should pick up. So I think clearly the markets are looking at these headwinds, uh, you know, from a medium to long term perspective. Okay. Avinash, stay on. So much more to talk about. Let's get in our technical experts on board uh, and try and figure out how to approach trade uh, this morning. Richard Jain, technical analyst at Angel Broking with us, as is Brijesh Bhatia, head of research at Deal Money Securities. Gentlemen, both of you, good morning. Thanks for joining in. Brijesh, if I can start off with you, uh, we'll, we're likely to start off, well, if the SGX Nifty is to be believed, about half a percent lower or over half a percent lower. Well, how does one approach trade in a scenario like that? I think one should look at uh, buying opportunity uh, on dip. So if you look at uh, the Nifty on Friday session, uh, on th Thursday session as well, uh, it was taking support at the previous uh, runaway gap, uh, which uh, it had uh, made uh, at the all-time high. Uh, I think 11,700 will act as a major uh, support on spot. So one can look for buying opportunity at the opening, keeping a stop loss of 11,683 uh, on the downside. It is a spot level and uh, look for the target of around uh, 11,820, on the upside uh, on the spot levels. So I would be a buyer uh, on a dip. Okay. Um, Ruchit, what's your approach to trade this morning? Yeah, hi, very good morning, everyone. Uh, if we see the broader structure, then the high top, high bottom structure, uh, no, which had started since the first week of March is still getting continued. But on Friday's session, we did see some indications of profit booking from higher levels. Uh, if you look at the uh, no RSI along with the price move, there has been a negative divergence, which indicates that we may that we may see a pause in this uptrend, and some sort of consolidation or corrective move could be seen in next two or three trading sessions. But having said that, no, this is this would just be a pause within an uptrend and not a reversal. On a, uh, if we see the moving average support, then the support is placed around 11,645. So we are expecting a minor dip up to 11,645 in next one or two trading sessions. But since the broader trend continues to be positive, we are adv also advising traders to rather than going short in this uh, minor correction, use this correction as a buying opportunity when the index comes towards the support of 11,645. Okay. Um Let's talk about specific stocks before we get to our experts. Uh, let's get to our special segment, Bloomberg Edge, where Yash Upadhyay tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a stock. Yash, what's the stock on our radar today? Morning, Neeraj. So we're tracking Inox Leisure on the charts and a sell signal coming on the back of the bearish engulfing pattern, which we are seeing on the charts form. Uh, but as we do always, uh, let's first try and understand what the bearish engulfing pattern is and how do you interpret it? Uh, basically, the bearish engulfing pattern is the formation of a large red candle right after the green candle, uh, wherein the body of the second candle completely engulfs the one ahead of it. Uh, the larger is the size of this red candle, the higher is the evidence of a top forming. Uh, coming back to the price chart of Inox Leisure, we saw the stock hit a fresh lifetime high in earlier day. In, early, in the earlier days of trade uh, and since then we have seen some amount of correction coming into the stock uh, in fact for the last three weeks it has been falling which is its longest weekly losing streak since November of 2018 and on the back of that uh, the bearish engulfing pattern to suggest that there is some amount of weakness as we saw the stock close more than 2% lower uh, on Thursday's day of trade. 
Okay. And how well has this worked for Inox Leisure in the past year? So Neeraj, it has worked fantastically <laughs> because six out of the last eight times that this has got triggered on a one year period, uh, the stock has managed to fall as much as 5% over the next one month. All right. Yash, thanks very much for that. That's Inox Leisure and BQ Edge. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens because uh, if you just look at what's happening in the last two weeks and what's likely to happen this weekend as well, is that the movie response or the response of the viewers to certain releases has been pretty strong. Avengers, Avengers Endgame. Endgame this yeah. weekend as well. So, so they're kicking, start, they, they, they're kicking off uh, quarter one with a, a big bang. Yeah because this will flow into quarter one. And quarter four wasn't bad either. Yeah, the, the, of the release pipeline was really strong for quarter four as well. And you can probably hope to see that translate into better numbers uh, for them in quarter four. So there is a bearish engulfing pattern, yes, and it's worked beautifully. So maybe a trading dip, but fundamentally, maybe some of these stocks could have better fundamentals uh, yep. coming up. Yep, 315 for Inox Leisure. But uh, in fact, let's get in a sense from Ruchit on the stock before we get across and get his stock ideas as well. So Ruchit, first come in on Inox Leisure and then run us through your stock ideas for the day. So one, uh, another interesting observation on Inox Leisure is the divergence in the RSI along with the price move. You know, since the mid of March, we have seen that levels around 325, 340 range comes and then again the, you know, the prices are not able to surpass that resistance zone. Now RSI in, the, in that mid of March was trading somewhere around 80 levels and now in, in fact prices are around the same levels but RSI has uh, clearly dropped to uh, uh, below 60 right now. So this is somewhat a negative divergence. I think that should lead to some profit booking and we could see levels around 289, 288 uh, because of this pattern. Uh, as far as my other stock ideas are concerned, uh, I have two buy recommendations where we are expecting some outperformance. Uh, one is AU by a small finance bank. Well, this mid-cap bank has uh, not shown any significant momentum in the recent up move in the, uh, in the banking space. But on Thursday's session, the stock price has given a breakout, signs of breakout above a falling trendline resistance and the volumes on Thursday on the breakout were also good. So this is an indication that we may see a catch-up move in AU Small Finance Bank now, keeping a stop below 578 traders. Short-term traders can take a buying approach for target around 685. And JSW Steel is my another uh, buy recommendation. Uh, well, uh, on Thursday's session, most of the metal names had seen some sort of profit booking, but uh, no surprisingly, JSW Steel has shown in a good buying momentum from its lower levels and the stock price is closed uh, almost near the higher end of the consolidation phase, which we have been witnessing in last two weeks. Now, if there is a follow-up move today above 302, that would, that would uh, turn into a breakout of that consolidation, which should lead to a positive momentum. So this is a conditional call to see uh, to, uh, to uh, go long only above 302, keeping stop below 290 then for target around 320. All right, conditional long on JSW still only above 302, according to Richard. It's at 299 now. Brijesh, your stock ideas? Uh, I also have a long recommendations. Uh, so starting with Crompton, uh, if you look at the Crompton, it has formed a double uh, bottom formation and given a breakout on uh, in the last week. And most importantly, if you look at the weekly chart, it has been uh, the highest ever close since August 2018, which is nearly now eight months. Plus, uh, if I look at uh, the MACD and RSI, MACD has given a positive crossover uh, and trading above integer line. Plus, RSI is giving a bullish uh, range shift. So uh, one can go long at around 237, keeping a target of 200. 49 on the upside and a stop loss can be placed at 232 if uh, someone has a medium term view uh, can hold for target of around 268 as well uh, second would be uh, the trade on ongc so if you look at the ongc it was largely consolidating between uh, 158 to 145 uh, for quite some time and last week we have seen a close above 160 uh, though slightly uh, at 160.60 but uh, it has given a clearly a, a good range breakout uh, so i think one can go long at around 160 60.60, uh, keeping a stop loss of 156 and upside target could be 170. Okay, those are some trading ideas from both our technical experts. We'd like to take a look at what's happening to crude oil and Brent crude now at 74. Remember, end of December last, at two th in 2018, end of December, it made a low of under 50, around 49.9 was the low that it hit. From there, it has just been trending upwards. You know, talk about the increase in U.S. stockpiles. Talk about the overall supply. Uh, con uh, you know, contraction from OPEC plus. Yeah, yeah, that's been coming in, and whether or not the the better economic data that's coming out from China is going to actually spur demand, which could lead to the prices 
also be you know, looking the way they are. So there are various factors at play here, and definitely uh, for equity markets, this might not all go too well. Now for the macro as well, and yeah. by the way, this was just the intraday chart today, and it showed that surge, uh, substantial surge, but I think, as Devina was saying, from 49.50 odd, I, I think the chart has just looked one way. Before we get in Avinash's opinion, just also want to mark what Uday Kotek has said, and I think it's not just us out here in the studios, but across the board, people are taking notice of this, um, and he's, of course, put out a tweet saying that oil is back above to 70 and the various things that it could do. It's, it's uh, high oil prices, very, very critical. Economy at large, too. And this the expiry is of the waiver of Iran sanctions, which is less than two weeks away, and what happens thereabouts. And U.S. has said that they want to drive it. I was reading a Bloomberg story today where they said that they're going to drive the prices or the Iranian oil exports to near zero. They do not want waivers being given to others as well. So uh, this is very, very critical and what all of this could do. Uh, to prices substantially. Um, Avinash, the macro is one thing and we know about it, but between 72 last week to where it heads right now, what's the quick impact on stock price? We'll do a detailed chat, but very close to market open. A quick impact analysis? No, I think it's going to be negative, Neeraj, uh, especially you know for the oil consuming sectors like the oil marketing companies, airline companies, tyre stocks. Uh, I would believe that apart from the economic impact, I think you might see a little bit of dent on the EBITDA margins of most of these sectors, especially airline companies would be the most sensitive ones. Uh, and you could probably see, you know, obviously prices coming under pressure uh, unless and until we see some consolidation. But at least in the near term, it doesn't appear that crude is going to stop at these levels. We're going to probably talk about you know how uh, this impacts the currency too because the so far the rupee has held out pretty nicely. It's still not crossed that 70 mark, but now with the, the Brent crude oil moving up so fast, uh, you know, at levels of 74, you could actually see some bit of a negative implication for the currency as well. 20 seconds left to go for market pre-open, and the SGX Nifty has worsened a bit. So you've got a, a full half a percent given up on the SGX Nifty, 66 points, and it was down a quarter, so it's worsened a bit more. And uh, the currency shot shop at 69.35. We're gonna see how that opens up in light of what the Brent crude has been doing. And not just that, the equity markets at large. HDFC Bank Reliance Industries from the Nifty are two stocks to watch out for on the back of their numbers. Nifty opens up, but it opens up positive. So but these are just initial numbers that are uh, that we're witnessing. So we're gonna keep track of that. But individual stocks, Reliance Industries uh, opens flat to slightly negative, so no major implication thereabouts. HDFC Bank is the other one. Uh, the numbers were strong. Uh, this is a 10% move, but obviously this is not going to stick. So we're going to wait and watch as to uh, how this settles around. And then you've got the oil marketing pack, all of them down. Uh, Indian Oil, BP, CL, um, HBC are not on the index, but that too uh, will be lower in light of what the other two are doing. Bharti Airtel is showing you a 9% cut. But again, an aberration, slightly more volatile ticks early morning. Uh, we'll wait and watch how <coughs> as to how that goes off. Uh, remember the rights issue I think begins uh, May 3rd uh, for Bharti et al. 25,000 odd crores is rights issue. Yes, bank is down. Bajaj Auto is down. m and is down. So the entire auto basket is looking weak. SBI too gives up in the session. Amongst the gainers, <coughs> HGFC Bank as a still holds strong. Vipro, Hindalco, Vedanta and now Reliance is up about half an odd percent. Currency weakens a bit more. So from 69.35 yesterday, we're at 69.78. It could reach 70 pretty quickly. Uh, bring up uh, Jet Airways and see what that is doing <coughs> in the session today. Three or four stocks that I want to mark very quickly. Jet Airways, uh, well, for now, looks like a downside, yes. And remember, out of the FNO band, so some trading positions could open today as well. We were looking at the 31% downtick the other day. Let's wait and watch what happens today. That is stock number one, the key stock to monitor. The other one, um, ICICI Lombard, and if let's see if there is a result reaction uh, to that stock. No, not quite as of now. Let's wait and watch. GVK Par and some positive news there, and let's see if that stock is reacting at all. A couple of percentage points higher, nothing too much. Uh, well, let's wait and watch what happens to all of these names. Uh, but lots of important ones to monitor in the session today, and we'll talk about all of these as and when the rates stabilize a bit. One stock, though, and Avinash, uh, this is for people who might be holding Jet Airways as the data shows the direct retail holding of the Jet Airways stock has inched up to 11% in the March quarter from 3% five quarters earlier. My question to you is for somebody who's holding on to Jet Airways at a higher price, 
and sees this stock down 15, 20% right now, would it be advisable to get out? What would you do if you had it in your portfolio today? No, I think, Iraj, I would uh, frankly uh, exit the position because uh, despite the fact that uh, you could get a strategic buyer post May 10th, I think the going ahead is going to be extremely tough. And I think uh, if crude uh, inches up further beyond $73, $74 a barrel, that's going to make the recovery even tougher. So I would believe that, you know, if at all uh, one were to look at airline companies, I think, uh, you know, uh, alternatives would be obviously be SpiceJet and Indigo, uh, where the operations are tightly managed. And I think clearly over the next, say, two to three months, unless uh, a lot of funding comes into jet and obviously crude prices soften a bit, uh, we are not going to see a kind of a immediate or a, you know, safe kind of recovery for jet. So I would believe even at these levels, probably, you know, the investor could possibly get out and possibly, you know, recoup his losses somewhere else. Hmm. In the global aviation, for one, obviously, there's some clarification that's come in with regards to the undergoing DGCA audit, uh, along with its annual audit. But uh, there are a lot of show cause notices that uh, they've also received. And whether or not this is in regards to, you know, the increase in prices is something that could weigh down for the stock as well in terms of overall sentiment. Uh, I think even in the near term, you know, this could possibly impact the stock marginally. But at the end of the day, uh, absence of one player, you know, from the market and that to a large player which controls almost 35 to 40 percent market uh, is going to definitely open up, uh, you know, uh, benefits for both uh, Indigo as well as Spice. So I would believe that, you know, at lower levels, if some were to have the, you know, higher risk appetite, uh, definitely in the coming year, hopefully, you know, uh, the company should benefit from incremental market share. Uh, despite the fact that crude prices continue to inch up, uh, market share expansion is definitely now very much possible for indigo so i would believe that you know this kind of news flow may not have a very negative impact on indigo and we may not see a kind of a very big panic sell off hmm. uh, bridgesh reliance industry is the big boy let's work with an assumption that it settles about a percent percent and a half lower there are a lot of downgrades that have come in post the results what is there a trade that one can take that bridgesh the question is to you Okay, maybe Brijesh can't hear me. Ruchit, if you can hear me. Reliance with an assumption that it starts off about a percent lower, is there a trade then one can take post that? Yeah, I think, uh, Neeraj, uh, if we see last uh, few trading sessions, then the stock prices have again formed a support base around 1330, 1340 range. And uh, even in last, uh, even in this uh, correction, which was seen uh, in, Seth, in the second and third week of April, the volumes on corrections were quite less. I think one can take a buy on dips approach if the stock price is correct towards 1340 support then look to buy over there because the risk reward issue again would turn favorable till 1300 levels are intact okay so that's of course what's happening to reliance industries the other stocks in focus would be of course hdfc <laughs> bank gvk power they've been a six and a half percent higher in trade 7.75 this deal to get in uh, saudi uh, investors into the airport uh, holding company uh, could be interesting. It will help them pay the debt. The only thing is the debt is 5,750 crores. I don't quite know if uh, a substantial portion of the debt gets retired or no. But the stock is obviously starting off well. So that's the other one in focus today as the pre-open rates look to settle down. Um, ICICI Lombard, uh, Brijesh, um, it's the one insurance player that has come out with numbers and three life insurance players slated to come out this week. How do the charts look here? I think uh, it has been uh, a strong uh, play. I think uh, another 12-15% uh, upside uh, I'm looking on this uh, space. Uh, and it has been one of the uh, good, uh, strong uh, volume uh, accumulation uh, seen in this stock. So another 12-15% could be seen on cards on this stock. So I'm very bullish on this stock for medium short term also. Okay. Uh, what about the fundamentals out there? Did you have a chance to look at the results, Avinash? No, in fact, Neeraj, uh, numbers were definitely uh, obviously better on a YY basis, but slightly below what the street expected. Uh, but overall, you know, looking at the kind of growth momentum uh, which the company has recorded and hope obviously FY20 looks a lot better, uh, I would believe that, you know, uh, this definitely could categorize as a good uh, play on the insurance sector, provided one has a slightly uh, medium to long term view. I think clearly from a medium to long term perspective, I think definitely we could see better traction in numbers compared to say FY19. Okay, that's ICSA Lombard. Two other stocks to watch out for. I don't know if there's any material impact to this rating downgrade from Brickwork Ratings and Reliance Capital and Reliance Home Finance. But uh, Care and Brickwork Ratings have downgraded their ratings to uh, A plus and A for long term debt program of Reliance Capital, uh, while they have downgraded uh, the ratings to A plus and triple B plus on long term debt program of Reliance Home Finance. Uh, both these stocks have opened lower in trade. Uh, but it's not been really a good time for the ADAG 
uh, stocks as such. But Reliance Capital, for one, from a business standpoint, is it investable? Uh, Devina, I think clearly uh, looking at the uh, composition of the business, I think it would be uh, probably uh, better to be cautious on the stock considering the fact that a large part of their profitability comes from the capital market side. Uh, I would believe that, uh, you know, considering the fact that the markets are at this point look fairly volatile, probably it's a better, uh, you know, uh, move to actually wait here. Clearly, uh, I would believe that Reliance Nippon, you know, from the AMC business could be a lot better. I think that is one stock where uh, I would believe the earnings visibility as well as the stickiness, you know, in terms of the customer base could be significant. In fact, that is probably the bigger uh, reason one could possibly stay invested in Reliance Capital. But on a standalone basis, Reliance Nippon is available. So I would believe, you know, that could be a better bet. Mm. Uh, three new listings, uh, you, you had Polycap, Metropolis and Rail Nigam. Uh, for one, we had a big move in Polycap on listing day itself, but are the valuations ripe for it? I think uh, clearly, uh, you know, within the electrical space, uh, the bigger plus for Polycab is that they have a very large B2C model, almost 60 to 65% uh, of the business comes from the B2C segment and where uh, the management is pretty hopeful that growth could be a lot stronger in the coming financial year. Uh, the financials definitely could get a lot better going ahead. I think with an ROE of uh, 15 odd percent, uh, the winner of this stock appears to be fairly priced as of now, but I think the markets are uh, penciling a strong 17-18% kind of earnings growth for FY20 and 21 so hopefully if these uh, you know numbers do pan out then probably you could see an earnings upgrade so definitely i think uh, you know one should hold on one should not exit but definitely within the electrical space uh, they have an integrated offering and i think that should definitely help them all right uh, just stay on with us uh, gentlemen lots to talk about but we're just minutes away from market opening and we tell you all that you need to know to stay ahead and trade today let's begin with the nifty heavyweight reliance industries its fourth quarter profit fell for the first time in 17 quarters while geo's arpu fell for the sixth consecutive quarter on the other hand it was a strong quarter for hdfc bank net profit rose 23 percent while asset quality and provisions both saw an improvement on a sequential basis. Among other results reported over the long weekend were ICSL Lombard and Tata Coffee, both met street expectations. Some positive news flow for Dr. Reddy's. The US FDA has given its formulations unit in Andhra Pradesh a voluntary action initiated or VAI status. GVK Powers Arm has signed an agreement with the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and the NIIF for a 49% stake in the group's airport holding company. And lastly, Brickwork and Care Ratings have downgraded debt instruments of Reliance Capital and Reliance Home Finance. Actually, that's the other one, isn't it? Tata Coffee as a, as a result, boy, we spoke about a bunch of others. Tata Coffee, the margin performance was pretty impressive. However, Arabica coffee prices have come off, Avinash, quite substantially, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, they are almost at record lows now. Record lows right now. What does one do with Tata Coffee? If you think, track it. No, I think uh, clearly uh, I would believe that you know sustainability of these margins would obviously uh, be a little more important considering the fact that uh, top line this time has not been very sharp. Uh, you know, my sense is probably uh, we could see a little more softer EBITDA margin in the coming quarter. And I think the overall impact, uh, Neeraj, I would look at is we track Tata Global more closely. So since Tata Coffee is a subsidiary of Tata Global, I think uh, it's a better bet to actually bet on Tata Global rather than a standalone business like Tata Coffee, which actually is a part of Tata Global. This one too has come off, right? I mean, for a labored move for yeah. years then moved from 150 to 300 yeah. and now it's come back. Yeah, the bigger, uh, I think, uh, upside is that uh, the markets are looking very clearly how Mr. Chandra actually unlocks value for the brands. I think there are a lot of brands in this company which, uh, you know, at some point of time could possibly see some value unlocking. So, Neeraj, at these levels, I don't think you're going to see a very deep cut. The stock has already corrected significantly from higher levels. So, I think somebody who's looking at a two-year kind of horizon, I think definitely fits the bill. You're going to see a lot of growth in these branded businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tata Coffee and Tata Global is a trade, uh, Brijesh? Uh, I think uh, Tata Global is the better uh, on the trade side. Uh, stock is uh, has a very strong support around 203, 204. So at around 205, uh, 206, one can take a bet for 224 on the upside, uh, keeping a stop loss of 196. Okay. Tata Motors is the other one. Uh, we had... Um, you know, we have a copy on the website that talks about the five reasons why uh, Tata Motors has seen this big uptick of about 50 odd percent and the move from levels of 150 or to a level of 235 where it's trading and you've seen uh, promoters increasing stake. The CDS or the uh, credit default swaps 33 percent lower 
at, on the 2023 credit, uh, credit CDS. So that probably shows that the risk of default has come off quite significantly from what it was at earlier on. Uh, China uh, economic data has been positive. They're growing in markets outside China at a fairly decent pace, 8% growth in the UK market and can expect a, a bigger growth number coming in from there. So things working for Tata Motors, Avinash? I think uh, FY20 should be a lot better and I think compared to Q3 where uh, you know the company posted a record loss, uh, Q4 may be slightly better despite the fact that uh, you know the company could still show a loss on the net level. Our sense is that FY20 could be a lot better, Devina, and that is what the market is penciling. So probably, uh, you know, despite the fact that the stock has moved up, I would believe that, you know, the stock may consolidate now, uh, moving from 130-odd levels to 235. So clearly we could see uh, some numbers, you know, obviously Q4 numbers and the commentary coming in, and, and thereafter, you know, the stock reacting. Okay. Before we take in the top trading call, Richard Jen, very quickly, 30-second answer, BP, IOC, Reliance, top three losers on the Nifty today, which is the best shot, if any of them? I think within the space, if one has to look from the shorting side only from a day trading perspective, then uh, BPCL could be looked. Although the broader trend is not negative, but uh, just from a day trading perspective, we might see the stock uh, getting corrected up to its support levels, which are placed around 340. So at current levels with the stop, uh, which opening is showing around 354. So with the stop above the gap area at 359, one can go short for target around 340. Okay. Uh, less than a minute left to go for market opening, so let's get in some top trading ideas from our experts. Richard, I'll start off with you first. I would like to go along on uh, some of the IT names. You know, HCL Tech uh, looks uh, good within the IT space. The stock prices have been showing an impulsive up move. Uh, last week prices showed some correction but again in that correction 20 days moving average has acted as a good support. So at current levels the risk reward issue is favorable. Go long on HCL Tech with stop below 1080 expecting target around 1140 to 1150. Okay. Bridges, quickly. Yeah, apart from uh, Crompton and ONGC I would go long on Bata uh, at around 1410 keeping a stop loss of 1380 and can look for around uh, 1460, 1470 on the upside. Okay, German, stay on. We'll take in opening thoughts from you. I must say, the pre-open rates don't suggest that we'll start off as poorly as the SGX was indicating. But let's wait and watch how the first five minutes of trade progress. But here's how we're starting off this Monday morning. One full week of trade. We've been spoiled by uh, truncated weeks. But for now, the start doesn't seem to be all that bad as the SGX was indicating. But slowly and surely, coming off about a third of a percent for the Nifty, nearly a third of a percent for the Sensex. The Nifty Bank holding out a bit better, maybe courtesy HDFC Bank. Uh, what about mid caps and the small caps? And I'll see how the broader markets are doing. Well, flattish, but the mid cap index definitely half a percent lower. So under pressure. So the pressure on Thursday session continuing in today's trade as well. Let's get the heat map up and show you what's moving and what's not. A lot of red, I would reckon. Yes, fair degree of red, very little green. Not enough gainers. Keep that at the back of your mind. None of the stocks have gains of over half a percent. HDFC Bank right somewhere here, half a percent higher, but that's about it. Look at the losers. All marketing companies right there. Reliance Industries, 2.5%. This is one key reason why we are under serious pressure. By the way, the Nifty Bank is down half a percent now as we speak. Yes Bank, India Bulls Housing, Indescent Bank, Kotak Bank, all of them under pressure. ICICI Bank and Axis Bank too under pressure. So banks are giving way. They were the ones which took us higher and are certainly coming off. You can just have the Nifty Bank once up on the screen because that suddenly cracked. It's down about 200 points and led predominantly by the private sector banks. But the Nifty Bank is the principal culprit, about 200 points lower as we speak. So certainly under pressure banks right now the top losing index uh, what about specific stocks i spoke about how the all marketing companies look like starting off lower let's put all of them up and see how the losses are stacked up bpcl three percent hpcl five percent lower in trade indian oil corporation about three and a half percent so it's not looking a very pretty picture for the oil marketing companies with crude oil spiking the way it has and uh, what about the result reactions um, icsa lombard as well as gv uh, as well as uh, uh, Tata Coffee, well, Tata Coffee has some upsides to it, but ICSA Lombard marginally below estimates and 1.5% lower. But Devina, certainly under pressure, three quarters of a percent for the Nifty Bank. Jet Airways is the other one, Miraj. Uh, that one continues to reel under pressure after that big 30% plus drop in the session uh, on a Thursday. Today is down another 18% to open. The other one also is uh, Divan Housing Finance. Crystal has downgraded the commercial papers with 880 crores. 
from A2 plus to A3 plus. The stock's down about four odd percent in the session. Other losers, uh, Arcom continues to uh, grind lower. You've got a PC Jewelers, so profit taking on this one. Remember, the stock's anyways done well. Uh, 44 percent in the last seven days, so some profit taking up the table here. Ignibles Real Estate looks weak. Reliance Power looks weak. That's down about three odd percent. Uh, you've got uh, the likes uh, of a federal bank, two and a half percent lower. DLF is down two and a half percent. Tata Sunshine is down. Um, You've got a Reliance uh, Naval, which is down to and a half odd percent. Taking a look at Rain Industries, two and a half percent given up, and then two other stocks um, that reported numbers. I think ICSA Lombard and Tata Coffee. I don't know if you've already highlighted them, but uh, RCSA Lombard is down 1.8 percent, uh, and Tata Coffee being the other one is up 1.6 percent. GVK Power and Fra up 9 percent. You've got a Sinjin, which is up three and a half percent. Tara Coffee, we just spoke about, and uh, no other bigger, big movers except for a JSW Steel, which is up closer to a percent right now. Well, that's certainly looking wobbly, and it's important to focus on the specifics and nuances of the market. So let's try and do that. Request our experts to just stay on for a bit longer because a lot of stocks are. Uh, falling and falling quite strongly. We discussed the oil marketing companies technically, Vinash. I asked you a brief question on the crude impact. <coughs> I'll nail it down to BPHP IOC um, at 73 for Brent. And no one knows what the prices would do. So we only can work with the information that we have right now. With the information that we have right now, if you had BPHP IOC in your portfolio, what would you do? No, I think clearly, uh, Neeraj, uh, I would avoid these companies and I think uh, the upstream players would definitely be better bet. Something like an ONGC would fit the bill which has underperformed for a long time but clearly looking at the trend in the crude price, uh, I would not be surprised that in the next couple of months, uh, crude is definitely going to get more hotter and that is going to obviously impact these oil marketing companies more severely. So even at these levels, if somebody were to get out, I think that would be a good risk reward trade because you could probably see these stocks coming down at lower levels maybe you know in few weeks or few months. Uh, no. This is, is sorry. No. This is election period, so I don't know whether they can actually translate these high crude oil prices and increase prices for themselves, uh, and whether or not fuel price uptick is a possibility. But nonetheless, inventory gains will be there. But this will all happen not in quarter four. No, beyond quarter yeah. four, I think quarter four is already discounted. So I think markets are not going to look at historical numbers. I think they are going to look at what happens in the first quarter of FY20. So I think to that extent, uh, unlikely that the government is going to reward them with any, uh, you know, benefits at least in the near term till you know 23rd May. So you don't buy them, which is fine. If you have them in your portfolio, do you keep them or do you sell them? I think Neeraj, it's better to exit because looking at the way crude has bounced back, you know, from say around 50, 55 dollars to now 73, 74 dollars, uh, I would not be surprised that if the rally continues, then I think you're going to see further uh, depreciation in the value. So I think it's better to exit and probably get into sectors like IT or maybe private sector banks, uh, where I believe that you know, be, till the elections also, I think you could probably see a better risk reward trade. That's what the street seems to be doing today, Devina and Avinash. Uh, IT is the best performing index. The four out of the top five names actually. Except for power grid, it's all IT in the top six gainers list, about half a percent higher. But uh, that may only be the day's phenomenon. Let's wait and watch what happens there. Um, opening thoughts, uh, Ruchit Jain, anything that stands out for you? Uh, a word on maybe Nifty IT, which is up half a percent? Uh, we, had a, we have a gap down opening today. And uh, you know, if we see the follow up move, at least in initial uh, five minutes, then the market breadth is completely negative. So the uh, support level of 11,645, which I was uh, talking at the start of the show, I think that could be tested. So we may see another 40 odd points decline in the Nifty. From 11,645, uh, no, if uh, any bounce back has to be there, then that level could act as a, say, uh, uh, act as a good support. Yes, Nifty IT index is showing a good bounce back uh, or an outperformance vis-a-vis -vis other sectoral indices. So I think at least if one is looking from a from one or two days uh, trading perspective, then one can look to uh, take long bet on stocks within the IT space. Two stocks that we believe that uh, could show some good up move. One is TCS. The stock has already given an ascending triangle breakout during results and a follow up buying momentum can clearly be seen. And other one is HCL Tech. I think one can take a buying position in HCL Tech and TCS from a day trading perspective. Okay. Uh, Rajesh, <coughs> want to get in your sense on an HCL Tech in particular. Not yet reported numbers, but uh, keeping in line with you know the trend that we've seen from the others uh, within the pack, how are you anticipating a trade ahead of the numbers to be for HCL Tech? 
And if you look at the HCL tag, uh, 1075108080 was uh, quite resistance. It was holding for quite some time. After a breakout, it is now taking as a support uh, levels. So I think uh, one can look for a long bet uh, ahead of results, keeping a stop loss of uh, 1075108070 on the downside. And I think 1150, 1160 uh, can be added on the uh, upside. Either you can, if you want to take a low risk bet, uh, can go long on 1140 call or 1160 call uh, buying the uh, options and uh, take a long bet. Okay, Avinash. Uh, in uh, in light of uh, or in light of all that's happened uh, in the in, in this uh, current uh, scenario, aside of oil and gas, uh, you mentioned that it's better to take an exposure to IT. Is that a tactical trade or is it an investment idea from a three month, six month, twelve month perspective? And if so, uh, would you bet on a large cap IT name or would you bet on a mid cap IT name? I think uh, mid-cap IT uh, would definitely do well. I think, uh, you know, specific names uh, would obviously be uh, companies like LNT Technology Services. I think this is a niche player in the ERD uh, segment. And I think clearly we could see uh, not only the fourth quarter numbers doing better, but obviously uh, the kind of order book and the kind of margin expansion which the management is pretty confident for the coming financial year. Uh, this is a niche player, uh, Neeraj, and I think uh, they operate at almost 18-19% uh, EBITDA margin, have very strong ROEs of almost 30-odd percent. I would believe that, you know, here you could see a significant amount of re-rating provided, you know, the investor is willing to give it a, say, three to six months kind of time because clearly uh, from an operational perspective, numbers definitely seem to be improving quarter on quarter. All right. Uh, Avinash, we'll leave it at that. And uh, thanks so very much for joining us this morning. Nonetheless, within the mid-cap pack, Mind Tree, uh, that's up about half an odd percent, but it's just around that 974-odd uh, level. Remember, uh, the total dividend announced posted numbers is close to about 27 rupees. Not much of an impact on the stock price, though. It's just about hovering around those similar levels. We'll have to wait and watch as to whether or not there is a response uh, to this from l and side. But so far, uh, nothing yet. Yeah, nothing yet. As uh, yet, Let's wait and watch what happens to Mantri. Maybe not a trading play, but interesting to watch. Just very quickly, final thoughts from our technical experts. Brijesh, uh, is there a trade on the Nifty Bank? Uh, Nifty Bank, uh, yes, uh, one can go long uh, at around 29,980, but deep, stop loss will be slightly deeper at around 29,700, and I think uh, targets could be around 30,600 in uh, one week's time. Okay, and uh, you know, among stocks which have done well, there is a bounce in Radico Khaitan today, 349 or 350. Rujit, any any thoughts on this one? I think one should uh, see this just as a pullback move because recently we have seen the stock price have corrected with rising volume, so which is not a positive sign. Uh, one should not get too much excited because of this up move of 4% today. This pullback move could get extended up to 365. Uh, that should be used as an exit opportunity. Okay, um, we'll leave it at that. Brijesh as well as Ruchit, thanks so much, gentlemen, for joining Thank in you. and giving us your uh, perspectives for the day. It's not started off as a very good uh, day for the trading week. One full week after a couple of truncated ones and the one to follow up as well. But uh, let's wait and watch if there is hope at the end of the day. Mahesh Patil, co-CIO at Aditya Birla Sun Life AMC, joins us right now on the show with his thoughts on the markets uh, and more. Mahesh, good having you. Thanks much for joining in. Yeah, good morning. We usually say that we'll talk with our uh, big fundamental guests about markets and macros. It's very important to talk about macros currently. Sure. Considering what's happening to crude. 74 and counting, right. no side of what it will do in the near term. With whatever information that we have at hand, what's your prognosis of what does it do to the markets in the near term? Yeah, so crude was the major, one of the risk factors, okay, which was there for the market because all the other macros were looking fairly good. I mean, in terms of uh, easing what we are seeing, rate cuts, uh, good liquidity uh, globally as well as domestically. And I think crude has touching around $75, where beyond that it starts to be a bit painful. I think until that, I think we're still okay in terms of uh, managing on current account deficit or BOP because we've seen good capital inflows. So good thing is that uh, year till date, uh, unlike last year where we'd see uh, capital outflows both on debt and equity, uh, we've seen almost $7 billion of inflows into equities and uh, a bit on the debt side. So I think uh, we're still okay. I don't think uh, alarm bell should ring at this point in time, but clearly if it goes above $75 or uh, touch 80 or so, I think, yeah, there'll be uh, some kind of a nervousness which would be there. And uh, yeah, until now, I think uh, everything has been under control. Inflation also has been uh, fairly under control. And that's the reason why we've seen the rate cuts, okay, policy rate cuts. So that could probably pause a bit if uh, crude goes up and that could lead to uh, induced inflation uh, and mm. higher inflation print going forward. 
So, uh, but I would say that crude uh, doesn't look like it should, it's a short-term uh, problem one would look at it because there's enough supply which is there, right? It's been driven by production cuts by OPEC uh, and Russia. So I think uh, if prices go up, I think you could see supply coming uh, back from these players. So I would not uh, expect that the crude should stay above 75 for too long. Do you see uh, this clouding the sentiment around the record highs for the equity markets that we have witnessed so far? Or not much of an impact? Uh, because, you know, it's all getting clubbed up. You, you sure. have, uh, you know, economic slowdown. And now you've got the elections. You've right. got crude oil starting to move up. Currency starting to depreciate. So it's just adding up. Yeah, so I think markets, uh, while they have rallied recently on the back of uh, global queues, uh, underlying recovery has been slightly weaker. I mean, we've seen a lot of sectors, uh, the numbers have come in in this quarter. Banks have reported good numbers, the private banks. But there has been some slowdown in a few sectors, like autos, for example. So, uh, so it's going to be a mixed bag in terms of earnings growth in this quarter. And that could lead to some volatility in the market. I think we've seen a good run in the market uh, in the last one, one and a half months or so. And with these, uh, some uncertainties around the election, crude oil, I think one can see some kind of a pause, a mild correction in the market, but I wouldn't be too worried about that. You, are, you, are you quite optimistic in terms of the end of year projections or probably uh, early into 2020? So, we are, we, I mean, optically the numbers look fairly good because uh, if you look at the earnings forecast, what we have and even the consensus, uh, it's showing around 20% plus growth for FY20 the bulk of it is driven by the banking sector, right, because of the low base, uh, especially the corporate banks. But even if you remove that, I think uh, we are looking at a growth of around 14% for the balance of the sectors, which is a fairly decent growth. So we are seeing recovery across uh, the sectors. Auto sectors will be weak this quarter, but we see some recovery in the second half of uh, FY20. Uh, other sectors like metals, pharma uh, are looking uh, good uh, in terms of growth going forward. And even domestic side, other sectors like uh, capital goods, for example, cement, should report a good earnings growth in FY20. So overall, I think uh, we are still positive uh, of good growth uh, in FY20, and it will probably be the best earnings growth period in the last five years, what we have seen. And that should really uh, help the market to really scale new highs, besides the near-term volatility because of some of these factors like oil elections. I think otherwise, uh, it looks to be a fairly good uh, growth outlook in FY20. Though I would say first half, uh, because of the slight slowdown we have seen in a few sectors, uh, might be a bit slower. The second half probably would be much stronger is what we would look at. Could there be a dichotomy between how the GDP uh, does and versus what could happen to earnings growth for the uh, index by and large, Mahesh? I mean, banks, because of the recoveries and not because of growth, sure. might continue to post good earnings growth. Right. IT could anyways do well because of the global factors, similarly for pharma maybe. Mm -hmm. So could the nifty earnings growth uh, still look good even if the GDP were to kind of just meander along or slow down uh, from where it is right now? So we have seen that, right, uh, in the past, uh, in the last few years, while well, GDP growth was fairly okay, earnings growth was fairly muted, right? Mm. And there was that dichotomy which was there. And I think it could turn around. I mean, while the GDP growth might still remain meander around 7% or so, we don't see any meaningful acceleration in GDP growth uh, in FY20. Uh, it could so happen that the earnings growth uh, could be much stronger because uh, a lot of the sectors which had got impacted because of various reasons, like, for example, the banking sector, the corporate banks, for example, okay, that's one example. There are other cyclicals, okay, uh, which uh, had seen an impact. Uh, pharma, for example, another sector which saw big earnings downgrade in FY17, 18. So these are sectors where you could see a much stronger growth, uh, mainly because the base effect, some kind of a normalization in uh, some of the parameters like margins. So yeah, so it's quite possible that uh, we might see strong earnings growth uh, despite uh, GDP growth remaining constant or just meandering around these levels. But for it to sustain over a longer term, I think you need to, uh, GDP growth has to uh, improve a bit from here for earnings. Uh -huh. If long-term earnings growth trajectory uh, we expect that to be around 13, 14%. I think nominal GDP growth has to be around 11.5% uh, or thereabouts. How would you place uh, your, I mean, by you, I mean, how would you <coughs> tell your fund managers who operate different schemes to position their portfolios for what will happen to earnings growth or GDP for the next four quarters? Is there, is, are there large bets on autos or have you scaled them down? Are you betting very large on 
the banking and financial services because the numbers could look okay. How, how does the overweight position stay on some of these se sectors versus what is it that you've gone underweight on? So yeah, we've, uh, we see uh, the banking sector, the banking uh, sector do well because credit growth is picking up and also the uh, corporate banks, the NPA cycle we think is behind it and some margin expansion uh, we see in that sector. So we are overweight on the banking sector. Uh, besides that, uh, the other sectors which we think uh, will drive, you've seen uh, there has been some boost uh, to consumption which has been given because of the uh, direct benefit transfers and being in election year, there's a lot of spending which happens at the ground level. So we see good uh, growth coming back uh, in the consumer, especially small ticket discretionary, consumer discretionary sector which should uh, show a good growth. And also, uh, we are, I think, more medium to long term, we think that India has a, as an inflection point where per capita GDP is now going about 2000. So there are a lot of sectors mm. which, which could see acceleration in growth if you take a longer term view, say next three to five year view. So uh, consumer durables and some of the other uh, uh, players in the retailing sector or uh, those, uh, I think we think will uh, do well. So that's more of a longer term story. But apart from that, even the capital goods sector, we've seen good execution by the construction companies' uh, names over there. And post-election, I think we should see again further new round of uh, activity around the infra space, new capital allocation could happen. So again, that's a sector which has also been beaten down a bit. Restricted recently. only to infra, or do you believe that cap good makers could also come back? Cap good also could come back, but again, it will be very selective. Cap good, we're not seeing a broad base capex recovery, especially in the large sectors, like for example, metals, uh, power, where it will still be sluggish, but uh, other sectors in the capital good side, uh, I think, should start to recover. So selectively in the capital good sector also, I think one can take a positive view post elections. And that apart, I think uh, other sectors uh, where uh, we would be slightly more balanced would be like in the metal space. Uh, well, valuations are attractive over there. I think uh, we've seen China again after some back. It's, it's time to stimulate the economic growth is coming over back over there. So that should do fairly uh, decent. Uh, uh, though we've, we've seen uh, big earnings, not earnings downgrade, but multiple derating in that sector, I think, which should stabilize uh, over here. And then other sectors like pharma, ITV would be more or less neutral at this point in time. Hmm. Uh, do you see now, since you spoke about cap goods and insure, which means that you're probably anticipating uh, the spending going up? Yeah, so... Uh, in investment? Yeah, investment sector? spending. See, what has happened is that in the last uh, two th uh, last year, especially, uh, we've seen the slowdown in government spending because of the fiscal challenges which has been there. Uh, but I think a lot of ordering which has already happened uh, in front space, I think the execution of that is now picking up, right, uh, pretty well. So, so that should, yeah, that should help uh, these companies to really uh, ramp up the sales and deliver good numbers. And I think uh, post-election, I think initial first uh, few months will probably be dull in terms of in terms of new ordering. But once the government settles down, we should see new ordering for the infrastructure sector to pick up. So I think that should uh, do well for the sector. And again, uh, here the valuations uh, we think are fairly reasonable. They're not as expensive compared to historical levels what we have seen. So, so I think that on the infra spend, I think there should be some increase. And obviously on the private sector capex, which has depleted over the last uh, three years, and capacity utilization levels are going up in a few sectors, I think we should see that uh, start to uh, result in better order inflows over there. Uh Okay, so while this is about uh, you know your idea and your outlook on specific sectors, I mean, what's your sense? And I'd like to get your comments in on uh, you know what's been happening of late in terms of uh, some wealth destruction uh, that you're seeing for retail investors, be it from the side of mutual funds having exposure to certain companies and those companies going belly up and right. uh, retail money completely getting destroyed. I mean, just to get in your sense, is to just, you, know, you know, how do you read into all of this? Yeah, so I think uh, we have seen that, uh, especially in the last calendar year, we've seen big divergence in the market. A lot of stocks have collapsed, okay, where uh, because of poor corporate governance issues or there could have been earnings disappointment, especially in the small and mid cap sector. And the investor experience has been pretty mixed, actually, while the Nifty is showing a kind of a positive return. But the breadth of the market has been fairly bad. So I think... Uh, clearly, uh, there has to be, it's, this market is such that we're not seeing a big buoyancy all across, right? It's been selective. And you have to be in stocks uh, and sectors, okay, where there is clearly earnings visibility. I think uh, purely uh, companies which lack fundamentals, and we've seen liquidity-driven rally, what we've seen, I think that has clearly gone away. We're not going to see a big 
liquidity coming in and which will drive prices higher. So it has to be with fundamentals. And uh, companies with weaker management, corporate governance issues, I think uh, markets have been uh, in a punishing mode. And a uh, lot of retail investors which tend to get gravitated to some of these stocks because they find it attractive. Stocks have corrected by around 40, 50 percent. People see value in that, right? Mm -hmm. But that will not be the case, right? Uh, companies with bigger fundamentals will continue to deteriorate and lose value. I think that's where retail investors need to be more careful uh, when investing. And it's better to really approach that through the mutual fund side in the small and mid-cap fund if you want to really enter into that space. But yeah. the problem being that the mutual funds themselves you know, uh, have this kind of exposure which is causing that kind of uh, value disruption. Yeah, that's the other, other bit, Mayesh. I mean, right. do you believe this whole conversation around, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, this exposure that, uh, uh, a small exposure that uh, your group had to Jet Airways and for whatever reason the stock came off and uh, social media was all uh, you know, talking about it quite adversely. And it's not just a question of what's happened to Jet and therefore the result in down ticket equity value, but a lot of other schemes wherein there have been select stocks on which the exposures uh, have gotten magnified. Yeah, right. Call it uh, the perils or the benefits of social media. My question to you is, <coughs> should people look at this very, very closely or would you say that because the exposures on an overall asset base are relatively lower, such accidents have always happened and will continue to happen. Uh, they will not probably change or alter the course of the overall returns that funds by and large uh, can give uh, sure. to uh, investors per se. And let's not forget Z also. I mean, obviously the, the, that was the exposure issue was there, but obviously yeah, think, there was an agreement so I think, that was reached. Uh, it's important, I think, when we are managing public money and uh, on the mutual fund platform, your risk uh, pra management practices what you follow, right? What are the exposure you take at the stock level mm. and the overall risk at the group and within schemes is something which we monitor very closely. And, and that's where actually we try to contain our risk, uh, even if at all there are any stock specific issues which could come up, I mean, over a period of time. So that is where we try to limit ourselves. And mm. if you've seen some of our fund, we mentioned about Jet Airways, our exposure that has been minuscule. It's been 0.5% uh, in the fund. It's been a historical holding. We were looking at some kind of a resolution over there. It didn't happen. We were taking a decision and we exited out of the stock. But overall impact on the NEV is very, very minuscule, right? Yeah. Mm. So it's a question of how you manage the risk in your portfolio over a long term period of time and deliver returns to investors is what matters to the investor. Yeah. There could be a short period, okay, where there could be some impact because of a particular stock or large exposure. But uh, if that risk is contained, and that's what the beauty of the mutual fund platform, right, uh, that uh, you mitigate, you diversify across uh, companies, across sectors uh, to really uh, take care of the risk associated with a stock or a particular sector. So I think that is something which uh, uh, we keep in mind and that really protects us from some of these uh, extraneous events at the stock level or at the uh, sector level which can come in at any point in time. Yeah, I think there are two um, sides to this story, isn't it, guys? That one is that you could look at uh, some exposures that funds have and try and say that they've taken a wrong call, but a wrong call is taken at different points of time by different sets of investors. The other is, what's and the that quantum? Time it, it need not be a wrong call no, when it was at taken the time a wrong of investment. Call, the, yeah, yeah that, that's a valid point. The other is the overall exposure that the scheme has as a percentage of his assets to any of those, and what's the damage that it causes to the NAV. So sometimes the issues are right, and it's, of course, media's job and everybody else's job to point them out, but the overall impact of that on the NAVs and the returns needs to be highlighted before um, going out and passing judgments out there. Mahesh, my final question on this, and we started <coughs> off talking about uh, the equity exposure to select things, which always happens. The other part is this whole conversation around FMPs. Now, I was with one of your peers in Chennai at a BQH event, right. and he mentioned that, uh, uh, I mean, his thought was that anything which is causing irritation is a great time to, is a great thing to buy, and corporate debt plans or or you know some of these uh, fixed plans hmm. are probably a good uh, team to buy because the market is worried worried yes but unduly worried about what could happen going ahead I know you look at equities but sure. what's your thought on this whole FMP saga that has happened and how should an average investor approach the non-equity side what would you do as a personal investment sure. uh, team into the non-equity side yeah, I think, uh, again, you should look at the overall how the FMPs have done or any other debt scheme right, over a period of time because, uh, I mean, there could have been issue with one or two FMPs, okay, because of uh, they're not able to make the payment because of some credit default which has happened. But by and large, I think we haven't seen any uh, major uh, impact uh, to investors. And uh, again, whether it's FMP or any other debt fund, okay, 
if you are probably very well diversified, just like an equity, right? We mentioned how you diversify your risk across the portfolio. And uh, see, there's some amount of risk we need to take to generate higher returns, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, risk returns, high returns don't come with unless you take some amount of risk, a calculated risk what you take. So if you're looking at some of the credit funds, for example, which have seen some kind of a, a hit in the NEVs in the last one year because of credit default, but if you look at a three-year time frame, right? Despite some of the hits, okay, whether they have to deliver the returns what they have targeted. And this is a time where we've seen, uh, at least on the corporate uh, debt side, uh, credit side, I think, uh, I think the worst seems to be behind us. Like when, once what we've seen in the banking sector, right? Uh, even in the corporate debt side, I think we've seen uh, a lot of the defaults what we've seen in the NBFC space, for example. Again, uh, things are coming back to normalcy over there. Liquidity is coming back into the system. So I think this is a time where you're also getting good yields. Right, to compensate for the risk. In fact, more than that. So a uh, lot of the portfolios, if you look at uh, the overall uh, yield on that, is much better mm. right, compared to where the inflation is right, and where the, uh, the risk-free rate is. So the spread also is at the widest level. So it's a good time to actually invest in some of these funds and, uh, and lock into some of the higher returns, okay, which probably will normalize as things settle down and uh, risk appetite comes back into the uh, market. Would you believe, Mahesh, though, and by and large, I've been in the side <coughs> of the equity CIO when it comes to a lot of decisions, as you heard from our conversation as well. I don't know what Devina's thoughts were, but mm -hmm. on the debt side, should the primary objective be uh, not returns, but giving uh, a slightly better than expected return, and therefore, the quantum of risks being taken by the industry at large, should they come off? Yeah, so I think... So again, that the yeah. returns are a lot more protected, even if sure. they might be slightly lower. I would agree. I think uh, there are different kinds of investors, okay, which come okay, to the mutual fund platform. So I think mutual fund platform should restrict uh, in terms of trying to uh, contain the overall risk, okay, because uh, there are other platforms where investors could go in for a higher risk, like the AIF or the PMS, okay, where there are more uh, qualified investors, okay, who understand the risk, what they are taking, and take that kind of uh, exposure over there. So I think, uh, it, yeah, I would agree that uh, on the mutual fund side, I think uh, whether it is debt or equity also, uh, one should try to really manage the risk in such a way that the investor experience, there could be shorter periods where, okay, uh, something uh, extraneous happens and you can't control, but it should be able to manage and come out of that uh, so that investors who stay along uh, with that fund at least have a very uh, reasonable experience. So I think in that context, I think a lot of focus uh, is coming back in terms of the risk management practices of the uh, mutual fund industry. And I think, again, as a learning process, okay, which the industry is evolving and maturing, I think. Mm. Just one last question, Mahesh. <coughs> uh, the biggest opportunity, according to you, for the equity markets uh, till the end of the year? One aspect that you feel is going to be the biggest opportunity and also probably a threat to the, to the rally that we've been seeing. What is going to be the biggest threat that is a little bit of an unknown right now, which is probably not baked in? So I think the opportunity is always, I mean, there, I think, for long-term investors, equity markets, okay, irrespective of what time they come in, we've seen as long as you stay in the market, as long as their time horizon is longer, I think you should make reasonable returns. And, and the market, while at these levels, looks expensive, I think one should not forget that uh, the earnings are a bit depressed, right? So it's, it's at an average level. So one should expect more or less average returns from this market over the next uh, a few years. But that is still good, I would say, uh, compared to... Uh, what return other asset class could offer and looking at where the overall inflation level is. Uh, risk, I think, is very difficult to say what could mm. play out. I think we've known certain risks, but uh, markets tend to really ignore them at certain points in time. Uh, one, obviously, is, as you mentioned, I think uh, we are, on the fiscal side, there is some amount of uh, limited room the government has, right, because of the various measures government in terms of distributing money. And also we've seen tax collections uh, hasn't been to that extent. So in that context, uh, if there is a pressure that either oil prices go up and shoot up, I think there could be some risk uh, which uh, one could see uh, onto the market. Election is another uncertainty which Mark keeps on talking about it, though I would say uh, historically we haven't seen too much volatility because of elections, say six months after the elections. Yeah, in the near term, I think that could be another risk factor, okay, which one could look at. But I think markets, all risks have always been there in the market, right? It's yeah. the opportunity, yeah. I think, which we need to look at uh, if you really want so to. So you're saying money. even at the, these prices, it's a, a good entry? It's a re reasonable entry. I would not say uh, you would make big, big returns from these levels, but I think you need to be in the market really to uh, get returns in the longer term. And any opportunity you get because of some of the risks which come in and the market's correct, I think it's a good time to really enter and uh, increase your chances of making higher returns from the market. Thanks so much for the candid chat, Mahesh. Always a pleasure having sure. you. Thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us today.
Well, that's an important market voice, Mahesh Patel of Bidla and Life. Let's take a break on that note. On the other side of the break, we talk about Quest Corp's latest acquisition with Chairman Ajit Isaac. Uh, he joins us. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quinn Live. Anything and everything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. This is a show which gets you a complete trap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. Everyone's a price taker, not a price maker out there. There are better opportunities in the marketplace. The return ratios will improve, margins will improve. What are you seeing? Valuations are extremely expensive. It would take 100 years of profits to really pay off the entire debt. Not all good businesses are good investments. Good return on equity could be expected. And I think that will sustain. Their numbers etc were pretty sluggish. How much longer they can sustain, I'm not too sure. It has never been the scenario in any of the stocks. It's an avoid for him at this point of time. I wouldn't write it off in such a hurry. They're getting into more complex chemistry. Join me as I navigate the hottest stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Welcome back to Indian Open. Quest Corp is set to acquire a 61% stake in all sect technologies for around 271 crore rupees. This in turn will trigger an open offer to acquire an additional 26% stake. To tell us more about the contours of the deal and the rationale behind the acquisition, joining us on the show right now is the Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Ajit Isaac. Mr. Isaac, thanks very much uh, for taking out the time. Is this in line with the aspiration to expand in the higher margin non-voice BPO business? That's correct. Uh, you have to see it in the context of uh, the platforms that we're building out. Quest essentially has three platforms, a workforce management platform, an asset management platform, and a customer lifecycle management fund. It's been our goal to increase the uh, uh, revenue share of uh, the customer lifecycle management platform because it's a higher margin business. And in that, you get non-voice and additional service lines. So Alltech has been a good target in that context. Hmm. What would the margins typically be, sir? So uh, Alltech is actually at about 20 plus percent uh, EBITDA margin versus Quest, which is working at about five and a half percent or so. So on a combined basis, we see about uh, a 30 or 40 points, uh, basis points increase in, in our partner structure. Hmm. This 271 crores that you're paying for all sec, uh, you know, these are a wire in. How would you pay for this? Through internal accruals. Okay. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, all sec in terms of uh, not just the margins, but the overall increment that's going to see for Quest Corp in terms of uh, the top line, bottom line numbers, and how do they shape up? So, um, uh, if you look at uh, Allsec, you know, on a normalized basis, it will do about approximately 230 to 240 crores of sales this year. So on 230 to 240 crores of sales, 
it'll do an EBITDA margin normalized again of maybe uh, trending towards uh, 50 crores based on the on the on the numbers that we have for the last nine months. Uh, add that to Quest's numbers, and we find that. Uh, uh, our margin structure is improving significantly. Our cash conversion is going to increase because all sex cash conversion is almost about 80% of its EBITDA. So that's going to increase the EPS of our company. And uh, <clears throat> lastly, uh, uh, we are adding two service lines to, to Quest, which is basically CLM and, uh, and the HRO space. In the HRO space, we have a good payroll product that they use among the largest deployed payroll products in India. They service almost about... Uh, about 7 million lives on a national basis, and that's a significant number to start with uh, as a base for the workforce management platform. Okay, so HRO business is also all uh, known voice, um, majority revenue driven by domestic clientele, right? How much of that, sir? Around 70, 75% you say? Yeah, mostly it is the domestic business, but it has a small international component too. Uh, the product is a is a is an excellent one which has a lot of scale that's built into it in terms of currencies that it can operate in, uh, geographies that we can take it out to, etc. So we are quite bullish about uh, how much we can do with the product. Okay, uh, Mr. Isaac, a couple of questions. This is Neeraj here. Good morning. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a large portion of these, or almost all of the monies that you need to fund this would be done by internal accruals. Should you be able to acquire additional 26% shares to an open offer? I believe that's on the table. Then I believe the consideration reaches up to 400 crores. Even that amount, comfortable by internal accruals? Yeah, we've, uh, we, we, have, um, uh, we have a structure in which about 193 crores of equity has already been infused into the company Connect, which is the acquiring entity. Uh, we have an additional uh, uh, debt component which we are extending from Quest to Connect itself. So uh, all of the all of the uh, funding that we are arranging between the equity and the debt will add up to about 398 crores. So that will uh, sufficiently take care of the total uh, requirements, including the open offer of the acquisition project. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, if I if I try and look at the la next. Uh, I mean, maybe it's too long a period to look at, but if you look at the next five year, seven year, 10 year trajectory, would you believe that a string of pearl strategy or making these strategic acquisitions would be one way, not just to increase the business momentum, but maybe um, to take the margins higher too? It may not be the direct reason why you have done this because it needs to make business sense, but I believe a consequence of acquisitions like this would ensure that the overall console margins would also move up. I think so. We have a principle of additionality in our business, in our uh, acquisitions. We look at uh, additional service lines, margins, and backing good management teams. So, in in all of the three uh, filters that I mentioned, Allsec qualifies. It's a friendly deal. Uh, people that we've known in the past. Uh, it's additional in terms of the service lines that it adds to us, and in terms of the margins and cash conversion it gives. So, if we get deals like this in the future, we'll continue to look at them, but. We're very selective about what we do, as you would have seen by now, uh, and it has to the check the, all the boxes have to tick off before we before we make an investment. So in that context, we're happy with what we've got here. It's a great management team, and I think uh, the prospects of building a larger HR, uh, you know, a workforce management platform on the basis of uh, the new technologies that we get with Allsec are very promising to Quest. As you chart your course, I mean, whether through inorganic moves like Quest Corp or maybe some smaller acquisitions or the organic growth that you pencil in, would you reckon that, uh, uh, and, and the reason I ask for your view as you've done this acquisition, as we've ended FY19 is that the street is very divided on the growth that companies like you, you and two others form the formal listed, uh, you know, space of sorts, a sector of sorts. What's the average a number that you pencil in uh, through organic or net organic moves combined together for the next few years, Mr. Isaac? Yeah, you know, one way to look at the future is obviously about how we've done in the past. We've had a compounded annual growth rate of 45% almost for the last seven or eight years, out of which two thirds have come through organic uh, you know, growth and one third has come through inorganic uh, initiatives. So one would be tempted to think that a large number of acquisitions would have driven a larger inorganic growth, but that's not the case. Our business is growing you know, inherently through strong growth sales engines that are working well. So I think if you expect us to grow 20% year on year, it's not, a, it's not a bad estimate based on uh, the past track record that we've got.
Mr. Isaac, obviously, while OLSEC has both domestic and international presence, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm quoting the concerns of some brokerages, they say that while cross-selling potential of a bouquet of uh, Quest's offerings across the Indian enterprise clientele uh, is a positive, the actual uh, positive with regards to the international clientele will have to be uh, seen as and when uh, things progress. Is that a little bit of a concern? I think that's a, uh, that's a slightly convoluted assessment of uh, the prospect of this transaction for us. Inherently, this is a, a domestic uh, plus acquisition for us because, you know, almost about 90% of the sales of the, of the HR product comes from, from domestic companies. So we think that uh, the position that we have in staffing, which is uh, a dominant position, we have almost about 220,000 people working for us right now. Uh, we have a strong position in facilities management. We have 60,000 odd people working there. The number of clients we have in both these areas will, will uh, you know, we'll be able to cross sell to that. So I think uh, a little bit of uh, deeper analysis is necessary in this from people who, who say that uh, there may not be as much that we can do in cross selling because the significant element of uh, overlap is actually in the domestic sector between uh, Allsec and. Uh, Quest for us, while it adds us the capability of two international service centers through which we can bid for uh, non-domestic, uh, you know, uh, voice play internationally. Okay, so uh, bottom line being, you're you're not uh, in uh, agreement with that assessment, and and the domestic play is the bigger play here for you, domestic That's clientele. Right, yeah. Okay, got that. Mr. Isaac, thanks so very much for joining in. Appreciate you taking out the time this morning. That is the management at Quest Corp uh, addressing the strategic uh, uh, acquisition that they make, 61% that they are acquiring in all sec technologies, consideration of 271 crores, uh, but they'll be making an open offer, so they'll have to pay much more than that, uh, closer to more than 400 crores. But... Uh, that's about all that we have in this edition of Indian Open. The markets are looking weak, Neeraj, down by almost a percent now. Uh, banks, even weaker, almost 300 points down for the Nifty Bank. Yeah, uh, come back and talk about all the FNO action. Remember, there's a new listing as well, so talk about that too. But uh, for now, wrap it up on this leg of Indian Open. Thanks so much for watching.